desperately need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education. About segregation. About humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. And hopefully this can be one of those spaces. This is Buffalo What's Next. My name is Jay Moran. Uh, Coming up later in the uh, program, uh, Dave Debo is going to take a a closer look at the reality and the uh, difficulties and the history of supermarkets on the east side of Buffalo. There's been a lot of talk about that, of course, since May 14th. Uh, But right now we're going to uh, welcome uh, to the show, Deidre ML, Executive Director of the Western New York Peace Center. Good morning to you. Good morning. And I also want to uh, introduce as well Thomas O'Neill White, my colleague here at WBFO, who is going to be, uh, of course, joining us here on Buffalo What's Next. Thomas. Good morning, Jay. Yeah, good morning, Deidre. Good morning. Yeah, great to have everybody with us as well here. And uh, Deidre, I know one of the things that the, uh, the Peace Center has been doing uh, since May 14th these healing sessions that you've had. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about the genesis of them, and then maybe we'll get into just the idea about the community healing and where it might stand right now. But talk a little bit more about these healing sessions that you guys have hosted. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, the sessions have been our our call Embracing Buffalo. Um, myself, along with a few other wonderful women, uh, Dr. Sabrina Njai, uh, Dr. Carol Penn, um, uh, Dina Adler, um, uh, uh, Kathleen Heim uh, from UB, a uh, School of Social Work, um, and uh, Vicki Ross, of course, our uh, board chair of the Western New York Peace Center, uh, all came together um, to discuss uh, what's next, right? Like that. Um, after all the... Uh, you know, all the hoopla of the, you know, of channels, you know, different channels coming out and, you know, people still have to continue to heal um, in different ways. Uh, There are many people that uh, were without and still without mental health services um, or don't don't have as much support to even pay for mental health services. And so um, we at the Peace Center understand that um, that justice and peace starts from within. And uh, Dr. Sabrina uh, uh, came to us and said, hey, you know, she is, let me give you a little bit of background about her. Sure. Um, I think I have a little bit of a note. But, you know, so she is a licensed social worker. She's a, a, a black healer and psychotherapist in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, and she comes, she's been coming to Buffalo for the last 10 years, I believe, um, as a a visiting professor at the UB School of um, Social Work um, uh, Continuing Education Program. So uh, so she knew Vicki, she knew Kathleen and said, hey, you know, I really love Buffalo and I want to help. Um, How can I do that? How can I reach, you know, the citizens of Buffalo? How important is it, you mentioned that, uh, to have a black person reaching out for mental health Mm -hmm. issues to a counselor that looks like them. I mean, I I think we've touched upon that, but maybe if you can expand. Right. Um, I think, you know, for healing to happen, trust has to happen first in whatever circle it is. Um, And you have to build trust um, by first getting to know a person, they, them getting to know you and them being uh, being able to relate to you. Um, sometimes it's, you know, uh, it starts with skin color, you know, it is what it is, um, or ethnicity. But then after that, how else can we relate to one another? Do our experiences, um, can, can you relate to my experience um, as a black woman or a black man? Can you relate to, you know, our experiences living in a, 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 a poverty stricken community or what have you? Um, so I think it's, it's it's about that. It's about trust. Healing since May 14th. 
it's probably different for a lot of different people, but can you give a general sense of what you understand about where the community is right now? Well, if I, if anybody knows about healing, it's a process and it doesn't happen. It's not a miracle. Like I've, I was always told that miracles and healing are two different things. Miracles happen overnight, right? It's just, you know, something, you know, it wasn't there. Now it's there. But healing is a full process and a, a wave of events and um, enlightenments, I would say, um, for the body, mind, and the, and the spirit. So for the for the African American community that um, that's on the east side of Buffalo, which is a part of my communities, um, I would say that it is happening, um, but. In some areas and other areas, uh, not so much. Um, some people are feeling forgotten. Um, some people are feeling invisible. Um, not just feeling that they, you know, they haven't been, you know, been put out, out in the forefront. Um, and and so what we attempt to do is to reach still, you know, those people, you know, in the in the trenches to reach, you know, this uh, embracing Buffalo really try to connect to. Um, the foot soldiers, I call them, the ones who've been on the ground, first responders Mm -hmm. that not just responded the first day, but has been responding each day and every day and today. Um, I'm not a part of one of those foot soldiers. You know, I believe, you know, the the Peace Center has its own part, um, but I haven't, you know, we support Pastor Giles and um, the Buffalo Peacemakers and Fathers and MVP and, you know, all those wonderful organizations that have been on the ground, the Resource, you know, Council of Western New York, you know, so um, it's our job uh, to to give that, to give support. So with these circles, healing circles, um, the first one was for first responders, you know, so the nurses of um, uh, Urban League, and 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 those who are outreaching um right on Jefferson and Utica came to those sessions at the uh Meriwether Library um and spoke about their you know you know what they're going through and and just being able to release you know all the um the energy and the emotions they have to receive from people and trying to help people that was a space for them to heal so they have more to give it's interesting that to mention about peacemakers because and you know, Reverend Giles and mm-hmm. the many, many other people who have been really at the forefront of yes. all this, it's almost kind of lost maybe to a certain extent how important their role has been to really try to keep the peace for lack of a better mm-hmm. better term, right? I mean there mm-hmm. you know, we talk about people hurting and being afraid. There's obviously anger as well underneath all of it. Oh yes. And these individuals have been out there trying to make sure that that stays at a minimum. And I would have to say, to this point, have done an incredible job. But the pressure Mm -hmm. must really be difficult for them. Yes, um, I I believe it is. And um, I think some people individually are searching for, are are getting some of the help they need. Um, I know it's it's common in the the African-American community that, we don't need mental health, you know, counseling, you know, we don't need a therapist, you know, and usually it's not necessarily the therapy or the therapist. It's, I don't need to talk to another white person to tell me what's wrong with me. And with that therapy, uh, you're a dancer. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about uh, embodyology. What does that mean? How How is it applied? Okay. So uh, now that in uh, Embracing Buffalo, this first uh, wave of uh, healing circles are completed, we in, I'm hoping in a mid-September to October, uh, for four weeks, we'll be doing a series on embodyology. So what is that? It is a term that was created by Dr. Uh, a, a, a African-American dancer and educator, uh, Dr. Ama Ray. And um, th- this methodology is based on West African principles of human communications. Um, it deals with breath, uh, uh, breath work, rhythmic mo- movement, music concepts that have shown efficiency in elevating the vitality and well-being of resilience and creativity. So what does all that mean? We're using movement 
to help to release the stress and the trauma um, of after 514 and not just after 514, but we have 400 years sure. of DNA trauma that we have to start to release from our genes and from our and from ourselves so that we can truly be whole as a community. You know, so this this thing that has happened, um, this massacre that has happened um, was more so what do you call it? Uh, just more of a, a, um, a outbreak of the disease of racism, of right. the disease of of classism. You know, it's just an outbreak. So, you know, we're just people are putting bandages on mm-hmm. this. outbreak. It's, it's a it's a symptom to yes. a larger problem. Yes, it is. Yeah. So we're going to use movement just to help deal with the individual from within so that that person and not only that person, but the community at large can begin to continue to fight for justice so we can truly have peace. Our guest this morning on uh, Buffalo What's Next, Deidre ML, executive director of the Western New York Peace Center, um, talking about a lot of different issues here uh, for sure this morning. I know that you're in the process now, the uh, Embrace Buffalo Mm-hmm. That those sessions are are behind us right now, but mm-hmm. there are you're you're trying to build up newer ones as well. Yes, uh, healing, like you said, is different for everybody. You know, how I, is this? I guess going to be an ongoing thing from the peace center. That's we're going to do this as long as we have to. Yeah, I think in um in different sessions at different times because you know the peace center is is. I would say probably more so known for our protests, right, and our rallies and um, and our advocacy. And, yes, that is what we will continue to do. But at the same time, uh, we have to also take uh, times to be still, times to, um, to come together and recreate. So those times are not always going to be shown out in public, right? But we know that doing that inner work, that truly inner work of 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 helping that person to deal with racism from within, to deal with community, you know, communities, microcosms of communities, to help them deal with those um, uh, 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 injustices, will help us deal with the larger issues at hand. To help us deal with the systemic um, issues at hand. Um, so we're not forgetting one to do another, but we understand it's a um, it's a mar- um, a a larger picture and it's a circle, you know, of healing. When it comes to that healing process, can you share what you've either heard or experienced from others when it comes to that, where they're at, what, I mean, I think Mm -hmm. to like the first couple of weeks after hearing about people still wouldn't come out of their houses. Right. You know, and it's, that's stunning, but totally understandable. Mm -hmm. But that, but that it's got to still be hovering over a lot of people right now. There are people to this day that can't even just go to a grocery store. Um, when when that day, when, on 514, I received a text, you know, that this was in the news. And it wasn't in our Buffalo news yet. It was just on Internet news. I called my mother. Why? Because she lives five minutes away from Tops. She shops at that top tops every Saturday. I go to that tops for her to do grocery shopping. My son has gone to that tops as he visits uh, the Meriwether library. Um, I had to call her to make sure she was home, that she was okay. So um, I would say for me, I still went to the grocery store the day after. I didn't go to Tops, A Tops, any Tops. You know, I went to the grocery store. I went to the grocery store a day after that. But I tell you, a week later, when I'm talking to my mother on the phone and she says, Deidre, um, be observant. I was in the middle of another grocery store and a, a fear, a fear fell over me that I never felt before after the event or any time to start to look at each and every person that walked in that store. And I would say the stores, the majority of probably, you know, 
you know, coca- you know, Caucasian, you know, people, you know, go to the store, you know, it's, uh, you, you. so my question to myself was, should I feel safe because I'm in a mixed crowd? You know, would someone else get upset with another group or with, you know, white people and want to do something to this store? And I just happen to be a bystander because someone's upset with them. I started thinking about, you know, why are people be, people being patted down <laughs> coming into the store? You know, like, where's the extra security guards? Mm. I had a fear, you know, and it, it was uh, it was for that. I would say that hour while I was in the grocery store, I had my heart started. Pump, but I didn't have that feeling right away. But I, I, I knew what she said was true. It, you should always be observant. But it was, I have always felt safe in those spaces until after then. So even though I wasn't there, you know, I live on the West side. However, I grew up, parts of my, my childhood has been literally on Jefferson and Utica. And I have taught children even recently as the spring, right before the event, actually, um, our Peace Jam program was at the Meriwether Library. So we had children that we will walk the neighborhood and we'll talk about, you know, issues. And so that's just as, re- you know, like I work in that neighborhood, you know, I connect to that, to that neighborhood. So, yeah, um, I think it affects everybody a little bit differently. For me, I had to really ask myself, like, you know, am I, you know, how much is this affecting me? You know, and how can I help somebody else? And I was actually just going to ask you with all with all this work that you've been doing, you know, um, pushing out this outward positivity. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you how you were doing. Does that does that feeling still persist of walking into a grocery store and and looking around and making sure you're OK? Um. Yeah, I'm more observant. Yes. But, you know, these these sessions, even though we, you know, help, you know, to sponsor, co-sponsor, it was for me. You know, I say, you know what, I can tell other people, you know, what's going on. I can encourage because each day was for different. You know, we focused on different groups, um, one, you know, one on first responders, one on the victims of, uh, of 514 and their families, you know, one on black leaders, you know, that have been, you know, helping, you know, in the community. And I said, you know what, I can spread the word. I can try to encourage my, you know, my counterparts and my peers to come. But this is for me. I need this. I need to sit in a circle and let just let, you know, things out. I need to move and I need to um, be heard and not judged. And that's what those circles help to do. It created safe spaces for people to just let it all out, what they were feeling. Some people were still angry really angry. Some people were hurt. Some people say, you know, you know, justice is not, it's not, we don't have justice yet for this situation, let alone the bigger picture, you know. And how do you manage all those different emotions from different people? You know, that you, you go back to what you're being taught in the circles is this breath work, you know, deep breathing. Why? Because that slows the heart rate that gives oxygen to the to the brain, which helps you to, um, it gives blood flowing in the brain so that you can think, um, uh, that you can think better and you think, what do you call it? Logically, you know, um, we can't make decisions off of our emotions, right? Emotions come and go. Um, but we can make decisions off of, you know, off of thinking and being mindful about our next actions. So taking in all these other emotions, I want them, I'm okay. You know, um, I have, I feel like I have compassion. I can feel, and I feel better that I can be there just to help them through whatever they're sharing and saying, it's okay for you to share that. I'm not mad at you and I'm not judging you for saying whatever you want to say in this circle. You are safe in the circle. And that's why like um, other uh news reporters and so on wasn't able to sit in on the circles to, you know, evaluate or to tape anything because we wanted to make it a safe space. That was very important. 
Our guest this morning uh, for a few more minutes is uh, Deidre ML, Executive Director of the uh, Western New York uh, Peace Center. Um, reflecting a little bit on history here, mm-hmm. the, the Peace Center had organized a march for May 15th, obviously long before what you knew yes. was going on on May 14th. And all the activity that happened right after that, I, 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 I kind of have all a lot of those events uh, kind of mixed together. Mm. Tell us about what you saw that day. On May 15th? Yes. So um, there was a big question. Should we still do the march? The march was on victory, mm. healing, and solidarity. And I said, yes, we're still going forth because this is why we march. And we are so used to as a nation, as a, you know, just society to be reactionaries. And we know that we are consistently dealing with injustice every day. Right. So therefore, you know, we've been planning the marches since I believe 2017, um, since, you know, like Trump came in office and so on. So that is so even though we didn't do it in January, because it's just too cold to do that in Buffalo. (laughs) I'm just sorry. The first the first year or two was great, you know, but I said, you know, the last couple of years was terrible. You know, we had windstorms and, you know, just it was just terrible in January and March. So I said, you know what? We're going to do it in May. It's Victorious Women's Month, and um, we are going to celebrate our victory, and we're going to continue to encourage women and families to continue to the fight. So, um, so it was just a, a really a sense of, oh my gosh, that's just this just happened. Okay, let's come together. We already come together. Let's truly march for our life. Right. Let's. And this was by uh, we marched to on uh, Niagara Street to Broderick Park. Broderick Park is such a significant space for African-American community and, you know, for for freedom, uh, you know, for for anyone as well, because at that park, at that uh, that place, it was the crossing from uh, being enslaved to being free. You know, from Buffalo to Canada, especially after the slave codes, right? So this was a space where people got on the ferry boat and crossed the river to freedom. Um, you know, we have ceremonies in my office, you know, every every uh, year to acknowledge, you know, this time and space. So what more perfect space to start our transition into healing and empowerment? but Broderick Park. So this was a space where we had uh, uh, African drumming and dancing. We had in, in the indigenous um, uh, women and sisters um, uh, doing the guñonio and giving thanks for our land and, and so on. We had people speaking out you know, against injustice and speaking about how they feel about what just happened. This was a space that we could let it out and be in a safe environment and be amongst community to support one another. Wow. <laughs> You've left me <laughs> speechless, which is very difficult uh, to do. Uh, we're down to our, our last minute, uh, Deidre. Just, uh, we obviously didn't touch upon a lot of the things that you have going on at the Peace Center, but mm-hmm. in, for the future, the immediate future, is the focus more here at home issues rather than maybe some of the larger issues that the Peace Center has been delving into over recent years? Well, both. Um, and that's this is why our task forces are so important. We still, um, we don't have as many task forces right now. We are um, uh, uh, changing some of our structure. However, um, our Latin American Solidarity Committee has been, you know, full force in uh, supporting Cuba and Latin America and all the um, situations and, you know, and issues happening there. Um, and we are, we also are uh, continue to support Afghanistan and um, and uh, you know so many places in the Middle East and so on. So our task forces um, um, are still re- doing the outreach for our the world community. Um, our immigrant refugee task force um, is still uh, continuing to help you know in those areas in in the city of Buffalo. Deidre ML. 
uh, the uh, executive director of the Western New York Peace Center. Thanks for joining us. Thomas O'Neill White, thank you. Thank you. This is Buffalo. Thank you. This is Buffalo. What's next? Watch Remembering Crystal Beach Park. Crystal Beach was such an important part of the lives of anyone growing up in the western New York or southern Ontario area. Relive those childhood memories with the WNED PBS original production, Remembering Crystal Beach Park. Now streaming on YouTube and the PBS video app. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. This is Dave Debo. For the balance of this program today, we will look at the east side, the tops market, and even the history of markets that rose and failed there. Historian Doug Ruffin will talk about groceries that were once there, one in particular called Figmos. But first, let's learn more about supermarkets and the mindset of the corporations that run them. Phil Lempert is with us. Phil is a national supermarket consultant, nationally known, with a lot of information online at supermarketguru.com. Phil, thanks for being with us. It's my pleasure, Dave. Talk to me about the entire supermarket scene nationwide and how unique this situation in Buffalo is. Why do large chains sometimes avoid smaller, low-traffic neighborhoods uh, and get accused of racism in the process? It's all about profit. Certainly, you know, in today's environment with inflation, with just about every supermarket declaring record profits with their CEOs getting huge bonuses, they've come under a lot more criticism. So when we take a look at food deserts, uh, probably the city that has done the best with it is Philadelphia. Um, Jeff Brown, who is one of the ShopRite owners, has a bunch of ShopRites, full, you know, full 60,000 square foot stores um, in the food deserts of Philadelphia. And what Jeff has done is he, he worked with the Philadelphia government, he worked with the federal government to be able to, you know, give him extra funding to be able to operate those stores. Obviously, you've got to have extra security, extra costs as part of it. And probably most importantly, what Jeff did himself is he went to the local community events. He went to churches. He went to whenever there was a street fair. He wanted to embed himself in that community, and he wanted to prove to them that, hey, yes, I'm going to make money. I'm going to own a supermarket in, in your neighborhood, but I'm here to serve you. And he also put in health clinics um, that were there for the community. So it can be done. There's no question about it, uh, but it takes time. It takes money. And frankly, it takes a commitment like uh, like Jeff Brown had. The Philadelphia experiment, though, you mentioned involved municipal subsidies. Talk about their role in other cities and what would be required in a place like Buffalo. Well, uh, so Jeff Brown and his wife, um, after they figured out how to get some federal and uh, municipal dollars uh, to help them, actually started a foundation to help other retailers throughout the country um, tap into, you know, federal funds. In fact, you know, Obama's uh, second State of the Union address, he invited Jeff and his wife to be there, and he, you know, commended them for the work that they're doing in Philadelphia and helping other retailers do it. So there's a way to do this, and, you know, you've got to do your homework. And, again, for these community leaders in Buffalo – Reach out to Jeff Brown, uh, Brown Supermarkets, uh, Brown Shoprites in Philadelphia, and tell him I sent you, and uh, he'll he'll help you figure out how to get a real supermarket um, and a great operator into that neighborhood. Are the stores where they have been successful different from their other stores? One of the arguments that uh, Wegmans has put forth locally is, we don't go into neighborhoods. Our business model is based on large stores in high-traffic areas, and neighborhoods don't have the kind of throughput of cars or people to make it worth their while. 
On the other hand, I can think of some local top stores that are really large, but out in some rural areas are really small. Are the successful stores that you spoke of in Philadelphia of all the same kind? Do they adopt different business models, or can they adopt different business models, depending on the neighborhood they're operating in? For any supermarket to be successful, they have to customize that store to that neighborhood, whether it's the size, whether it's the assortment of products. And to be honest with you, I don't think that Wegmans uh, does belong in that neighborhood. Um, Wegmans is a fabulous retailer. I know Danny and Colleen Wegman. Um, they are wonderful people, wonderful uh, operators. Uh, but Wegmans is not a store for that neighborhood. Um, I think an Aldi would be a smaller store that, that focuses on price and private label and having a great assortment of both healthy foods and indulgent foods. Um, I don't think that, you know, you can just take whatever the store is, again, like a Wegmans or a Publix, and plop it down in a neighborhood without understanding the neighborhood. And, yes, um, in Philadelphia, um, Jeff Brown's shop rights are your typical shop rights. But as I mentioned, you know, he put in health clinics, which he doesn't have in his other stores, because that's what the community told him that, that he wanted. So what we really need are operators who listen to the community needs, who satisfy it, who don't say, okay, you know, I'm going to have a cookie-cutter model, or just look at demographics and say, okay, well, this neighborhood, you know, only wants junk food and snack food and foods that are high in fat, sugar and salt, so that's what I'm going to sell. No, these retailers have a responsibility um, to offer healthy foods, to offer produce, uh, but also if we want to keep them there, they've got to be able to turn a profit as well. There is a big community push to try and perhaps bring another store into this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Do those kind of grassroots efforts bear fruit? Uh, it depends. It depends on whether or not there's enough opportunity for two stores. What I would have done with Tops, and, and this might sound crass and horrible, I would have leveled the store uh, the same way that we've seen when these disasters happen with schools and other things. You know, you get rid of the store, you build a new store, you know, within walking distance of the old store, so you don't have that baggage. Um, so that when, whether it's employees, whether it's uh, shoppers that, that come in, whether it's, you know, vendors, whether it's the truck drivers who deliver to that store, every time that they go into that store, you know, um, a disaster looms in their, in their minds. So you want to eliminate that. So I would not have reopened that store. I would have leveled it and built a new store nearby. The argument that was raised against that is that it would just take too long in a community where there isn't a supermarket, you would have that much more time where there isn't an operating supermarket. I would disagree. Um, if I take a look at Amazon with their Amazon Fresh format, um, they build stores really quick. You know, if you want to build a store um, really quickly, you can do that, even during the pandemic, even during... Um, a time where we've got shortages from construction and labor shortages and so on. Um, there's things that you could have done in the meantime. Um, you look at uh, Stu Leonard's in the New York metro area. Uh, when they had one store and they wanted to expand to another store, guess what they did? They didn't build a store right away. They put up tents. They had an outdoor store uh, for probably about two or three years before they actually committed to brick and mortar. So there's ways that you could do it. You could put up temporary stores. You could put up, you know, we see pop-up stores all the time. Um, this is not, again, rocket science, uh, but it is more expensive. There's no question about that. Uh, but if you, if you want that community to rally behind you and keep your employees and keep your shoppers, you know, you, you've got to make them feel comfortable. And just reopening, you know, another store um, doesn't do it. I'll, I'll give you a, a great example of a great retailer. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, Trader, uh, Whole Foods probably did the best job 
whenever they had an outbreak of an employee with COVID. What they would do is they would shut their store down immediately. It would go, and everybody was paid for three days as a crew came in and really, you know, cleansed the whole store. And whether it was an employee or a shopper, they felt comfortable because Whole Foods said, we want to protect you. We want you to feel safe. And that costs money. But in the meantime, you know, Whole Foods kept their customer base. Can community efforts work? Uh, if, if a coalition of ministers starts a petition drive, will in Aldi come? Again, um, Aldi is one of the fastest growing retailers in the U.S. They're a low price leader. Um, they're a great retailer. Um, and what, what these community leaders have to do uh, to get an Aldi there is not only, you know, appeal to all these heartfelt sympathy, but show them the business case model. Show them that if, in fact, they come to this neighborhood, they can make money. Because if they can't make money, they're going to leave. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. And bottom line, when I was growing up, there was Pathmark, there were ShopRite, there were other stores. And as Newark changed, these stores closed. And they closed because they couldn't make money. And the other thing to realize and to remember is for a lot of people that are on SNAP benefits or other assistance programs, what they do is they shop once. They shop as soon as they get those benefits, and that's it for the whole month. So you've got to really look at that traffic pattern on whether or not you can operate a store where, you know, you have a burst of people coming in. Um, at the beginning of the month, and then the rest of the month, nobody's there. Um, it's similar to what the military commissaries have to deal with uh, day in and day out. Now, there you've got, you know, federal funding to, to help support it. But, you know, on payday, um, all the soldiers and their families go to the commissaries. They buy everything they need for the month, and the stores empty the rest of the month. So there's a lot of business models that these community leaders have to realize, have to understand, and whether it's to an Aldi, whether it's to a ShopRite, whether it's to any retailer, really present the case on here's how you're going to make money, here's the problems in the community, we're looking for you to be a community leader where you're going to have a loyal customer base, um, and you're going to make money. Talk a little bit about the role of co-ops. There has been a community drive locally to try and start more of them. Obviously, if their doors are open and they're serving people, they fill a gap. But uh, do they have longevity? How do they fit into solving this overall problem of some places that just have food deserts? Well, co-ops um, are growing, um, but co-ops, don't forget, really rely on volunteers. So the problem that you've got um, especially right now with the labor force, um, you don't have a lot of people who are looking to volunteer. People want to get paid as inflation goes up. So, you know, you've got that yin and yang going on that, yes, a co-op can come in, a co-op can be less expensive, a co-op can have fresher foods, healthier foods, um, serve the community, but you still have to rely on a huge volunteer force to keep that co-op alive and, and striving. Noted national consultant Phil Lempert is with us, supermarketguru.com. You've possibly seen him on the Today Show or Good Morning America. You forgot the most important credit in my career, coming up to Buffalo on KBW, <laughs> you know, you, and, and uh, sitting in on AM Buffalo. You used That's to be a regular. I remember this. Yes. You used to be a regular on AM Buffalo. Uh, one of our predecessor stations, uh, WEBR, I know you were on weekend at your service quite a bit. Yes. You, you know this town. Yes, I do. I do. Phil, why, why do supermarkets fail? Uh, is it a matter of the business model not being appropriate for the neighborhood? Or is it a matter of, is it a matter of just volume? Not enough people to support, perhaps, in one area, two stores. It depends on what that chain is looking to do. And things have changed dramatically in, in the past two, three years, certainly as it relates to delivery. 
and we're seeing more retailers like Kroger, for example, the second largest food retailer um, in, in the nation, right behind Walmart, now starting to go into areas where they don't have stores, but they just have robotic um, micro fulfillment centers to do delivery and pickup. So it could very well be that the next iteration for this neighborhood is pick up and delivery without having a store. Now, the problem with that, um, especially when we look at food deserts, is a lot of people might have two jobs um, or more than two jobs, and you can't leave you know, groceries on somebody's doorstep because there, there are yeah. you know, people who go and steal them. So, you know, you don't want to do that. Um, but, you know, what, what a retailer has to do is they've got to figure out how do I serve the community, how do I make money, how does this one store fit in my community of 20 stores or 100 stores or 3,000 stores? Um, what's, what's the right mix? And you do have retailers, and we saw this in Chicago. When Rahm Emanuel was, was mayor, where he you know, got everybody, all the retailers together, and he said, okay, we've got to fix our food desert problem, and retailers did commit to that, but they didn't make any money. Um, and a year, two years later, a lot of them had to close. So you know, we've got to figure out for 2023, um, you know, what is the right model? for Buffalo as a whole and, and this neighborhood in particular, that we can serve, you know, these people good, healthy, affordable food. Um, and, you know, frankly, people are going to dollar stores to buy food less expensively. They're buying food on Amazon. You know, everybody wants to sell food because we buy food 2.2 times a week, more than any other uh, thing that we buy. So, you know, there, there's an opportunity there. But again, you know, and, and I'll say it again, for any operator to be successful, I don't care whether it's Aldi, ShopRite, Kroger, um, Tops, anybody, they have to understand the community. They have to understand the life point, the DNA of that community, if in fact they're going to be able to serve them well. That being said, is there a role for a store that is not necessarily owned by a Topps or a Wegmans or an Aldi. I, I think back to the early 80s, there was a store called Figmo's. A former Topps executive uh, said, finally, I got my own store, Figmo's, PTL. Mm -hmm. yep. a and he opened it, and it folded uh, about two years later because of some distribution problems. In the current, And this was a long time ago, obviously, but in the current world, yeah. is it possible for an independent to run something like a Figmo's, or do they have to be part of Topps, Wegmans, Aldi, et cetera? Yes, it's possible for an independent to come in with one store and make money. Uh, what they have to do is they have to be part of, whether it's a co-op like Wakefern, um, which is the co-op for ShopRite owners. The reason that these independents um, go out of business is they don't have the purchasing power. But if you belong to one of these warehouse groups, yes, you can make money as an independent with one store. You can serve your community. Um, you can have a full-size 40, 45,000 square foot supermarket um, and do really well. But you've got to have that wholesaler backing you up. And lastly, Phil, in our entire discussion here, uh, we are obviously looking at this in the context of what happened with the shooting in Buffalo where black people individually were targeted. In a, yep. general, in a general sense, do you think food deserts are a racial issue or not? I think, that, I think part of it is racial, absolutely. Um, and, and again, you know, people, people who live in food deserts don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to live in a food desert. Right. Uh, they, they, they just don't do that. Um, they can't afford to live somewhere else. And I think as a society, what we really need to do is we need to get rid of the term food deserts. We need to have uh, strong commitments. The same way just about every retailer, um, food and non-food retailer, every CPG company have committed to sustainability efforts, 
Well, for me, sustainability is not just about, you know, carbon emissions and sustainability of our society. And we have a responsibility to make sure that no one goes hungry, that people have affordable, healthy foods. You look at the obesity situation that we have in this nation, it's a shame, and it's getting worse. It's not getting better with all the apps that we have, with all the you know computerized diet scales, with all you know the diet foods, with with all the efforts of the soda companies having no sugar sodas now and things like that. We're still getting fatter, and what we really need to do is put a lens on this situation of, of promoting healthier, affordable foods in every part of the nation. And that, to me, is part of sustainability. And it's number one when it comes to sustainability. A lot of the activists on the east side that discuss this issue don't use the term food desert. They refer to it as food apartheid. It sounds like you're taking a step away from that and just saying it's an issue we have to address regardless of the blame. I don't, I don't want to give any yeah. shade to uh, racism here, but I wonder if uh, you just think that it's appropriate to, to completely frame the issue differently. Absolutely. This is a very serious problem that we've got that leads to increased health care costs, leads to crime, leads to mental illness, all of the above. And if we can't take care of each other, from a health and wellness and and a food standpoint, um, we're lost. You know, my grandfather's a dairy farmer. My father's a food manufacturer. And I grew up, you know, understanding that I have to give, if I want respect from other people, I have to give respect. And it's mutual respect that we don't have anymore. And if we do that, especially as it relates to food, we can have, you know, a great supermarket in any neighborhood in the country. Phil, thanks so much for your okay. time. And Dave, always it's a pleasure. And, uh, and thank you for all the hard work that you do for everybody in Buffalo. Phil Lempert from SupermarketGuru.com. Now, once upon a time, in the late 80s, there was a thriving grocery store on Jefferson. It wasn't an Aldi's or a Wegmans or a Super Duper. It was Figmo's PTL. Owner Doug Goggins fought so long and hard to develop it that he named it Figmos, F-I-G-M-O-S, standing for Finally I Got My Own Store, PTL, praise the Lord. It is such a part of East Side lore that there's even an online documentary about it produced by Buffalo History Works and available on YouTube. Let's hear a little bit of that. But most of all, Figmos was a representation of black business ownership and empowerment. In addition to Figmo's, there was another black supermarket, which was just as prominent a decade earlier in the early 1970s. That was the Topps Market, which stood in the middle of the Town Gardens Plaza. July 25th, 1972 was the date the Topps Friendly Market franchise opened its location in the Town Gardens Plaza to the black community, putting up the capital were four organizations, the Coalition for Capital Corp., Niagara Frontier Service, the Small Business Administration, and Marine Midland Bank. Mr. Castellani, why would you invest money in this area when other people are moving away? I don't agree with you when other people are moving away. Right around the neighborhood, there's uh, hundreds of new apartments. There's growth in this area. This area is not moving away, it's moving in. Well, uh, speaking for Marine Midland, I think uh, we can say that we've always been interested in redevelopment. We think the inner city uh, offers, a, offers us a chance for an investment, a profitable investment, just as any other area. Manager Carl Mackin states on that day, now we black people here in Buffalo can really be proud. We all live in the community, and we expect to be supported by the community. Among those overseeing the top's operation with Mackin was a young man who had the distinction of being the first black supervisor at Niagara Frontier Service, which supervised tops as well as other supermarkets in the area. That young man's name was Douglas Goggins Jr. 
Goggins had always dreamed of owning his own supermarket from the time he was first hired as a part-time clerk for the A&P at the age of 16. His journey to become an entrepreneur would not be an easy one as he was turned down for a loan by two banks. The third time was the charm, however, as his proposal for financing was accepted by m and Bank under the SBA Loan Guarantee Program. And on June 15, 1981, Figmo's PTL officially opened to the Buffalo community. In an interview with the Buffalo Challenger, Goggins stated, People in the community are in great need of a supermarket within their reach. The community is crying for someone to care. On a Sunday afternoon, on October 17, 1982, during a Figmo's Unity Day event inside the Client Hands Music Hall, Goggins delivered shocking news to the community that the supermarket, which he had dreamed of owning and had labored and prepared himself for for over 25 years, was in danger of closing. He stated, quote, It's a shame to see 125,000 black people and our black businesses are struggling to survive. It's a shame that we go to our competitors and support them and down our own people. Unquote. A day later, 100 residents showed support as they showed up to the offices of his supplier, Peter J. Schmidt, as he met with the executives in an effort to save his supermarket. In an interview with the Buffalo Challenger in April of 1983, Goggins states that there were three factors leading up to the supermarket's impending demise. One was a lack of support. Doug Ruffin is the voice of that documentary, a former on-air talent at WUFO and WBLK. He's the curator of Buffalo History Channel on YouTube, and he's with us now. Doug, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Why did Figmo's close? It had to do with uh, the support, also the support of the community. It was good in the beginning, but I think towards the end, it started to things started to taper off with it. They all, there's also the uh, competition of other other supermarkets coming up around in the area, the Central Park Plaza as well. Here's why I asked the question, though, because in the current discussion, there's a lot of talk about racism. Your explanation of Figmo's included the idea that there was a lack of community support. Explain. Well, usually, usually when, when something begins, it'll, it'll, you know, the support will, will be there, the curiosity will be there, but at, at, a, cert, at, at a certain point, you know, other the comp- competition will kick in and then there then there will be there, then there will be naysayers that will say that you know maybe they're that will feel like the quality the quality of the food is not what they feel that it should be in 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 most cases it actually it's actually the same but usually when um if the if the financial support would tend not to be there they they might not be able to get the same quality of food Given to them as would as would be given to another competitor that that has more money. And as we said, Figmo stands for finally I got my own store. It was an independent store, not a Bell's or a Loblaws. Is that a reason for some of these quality concerns? Right. That that that, that that's exactly what it what it can be. And his his intent to Mr. Goggins Douglas Goggins' intent really was to sh- show and prove to the community that. That you that we could own our own supermarket if we supported it. He he did his part. He used the experience that he built up when he was uh, when he was one of the overseers for, of the Tops Market that was in the Town Gardens Plaza back in the early 1970s. Doug Ruffin is here. He's the content curator for Buffalo History Channel on YouTube, a place to learn a lot about the East Side. Doug, let's fast forward now, though, from the history to today. There are those that say there is racism involved, that a business, a supermarket chain, is uh, not going to set up shop on the East Side. But you argue that the business, the, the market, is already there, that people need to have a store. I would say then one of the things after that whole tragedy took place, there was a lot of things that I didn't know about the, the Tops Market on Jefferson. But I, over time, I, I have discovered, you know, that a lot of people in the area have utilized that supermarket. It was mostly utilized by senior citizens in the area. And as a matter of fact, my my own parents, which I actually did not know 
actually went frequented that market. I actually thought they went to Wegmans, but I guess that's what happens when you're not living in the, in the area anymore. But from what I've heard, that I know that the, or the market came under some new management in recent years, and a lot of people have been supporting that market. So I, I would say that that the mentality has has existed, but it seems to have been getting better. Over time, Jefferson has changed. Back in the Figmo's day and even before, you had a thriving commercial strip, something similar to maybe Elmwood Avenue or Hurdle today. What changed? When did it change? Much of the change took place in uh, the summer of 1967, where you had a um, civil unrest in, in the community. There was a uh, It stemmed from a uh, police brutality incident that took place on Sycamore, and something just snapped in some of the, the young people and they kind of ran up and down the street and they, a few 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 of a few buildings got affected and so a lot of the police were called that pretty much was the seed that was planted for the area started to go down a little bit most of those businesses were actually white run businesses most of them and most of them left the area right after on the heels of that ride and moved moved their their businesses to other parts of the city and some of those buildings kind of just went dormant. By the time you got into the 70s, you had a, had a number of black businessmen that took over some of the establishments. And that's when you you started to see a small uptick in some businesses that were starting to sprout up in, in the Cold Spring area. Some lasted and some didn't, but it never really rose to where it was in like the 50s and going back earlier than, earlier than that. And... Basically, there's always been efforts to try and maintain it, but most businesses didn't really last. What did those businesses need that they didn't have, Doug? I would say mostly the most of the support, not just from you know terms of funding, but also just most of the support. They weren't able to get a lot of people into coming back, and once those businesses left, and people started, go, people had more of a desire to go out. To the, to the shop at the malls in the suburban areas, and that's really what was a contributing factor into those businesses coming down. After the death of malls, we have seen the rise of, say, again, Hurdle Avenue, uh, the shopping strip easily out in very white East Aurora, the Elmwood Strip. All of those areas, after the fact, many years later, were able to rise. Why not Jefferson? Uh, mostly because there have there hasn't been a, a a real activity in terms of really start anybody coming on to the to Jefferson Avenue and really starting a business. I believe some of those buildings are owned by the city. I think there could be some. I do think there could be some potential becoming people are becoming more entrepreneurial and people are really big on promoting their businesses and everything. If they could probably, I feel like if they could take some of that energy and take over, go on, go down on Jefferson and take over some of those buildings, you could see a huge change, but people are going to have to really apply themselves to really doing that. And lastly, if, if you had a magic wand, what would you create? What does Buffalo need? I would, def- I would definitely make sure, I would wave my wand and make sure that every vacant building on Jefferson was occupied with some, some sort of business down there. Because, I mean, we have... We used to be a time when most people would, most young people would leave the city, and now it seems like you, people are take people take more pride in in being from Buffalo and being and living in Buffalo. If they could, I mean, we have this whole thing of Buffalo and all this other stuff. They could take take some of that energy, and, and most people are entrepreneurial. They a lot of people want to be business owners. If they could get some more support, and I would love to see that whole Jefferson business area thriving. And not just restaurants or whatever, but then people have to, they could find some way to occupy those buildings. That's what I would that's what I would raise my wand to do. Very good. Thanks so much for your time. All right, man. Doug Ruffin is the content curator at Buffalo History Channel. Before that on supermarkets, Phil Lempert from supermarketguru.com. We are committed to having these kind of discussions for you each and every day. We'll be back tomorrow here on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown. This is Dave Debo. Thanks for listening.